welcome back, back, back to another video with your host, Brendan ASMR. In tonight's video, I'll be doing a week 7 recap along with a week 8 waiver wire pickups. So, if you're into fantasy football and you want to skip ahead to that part of the video, I'll leave a timestamp back down below that you can click on. If not, then you've come to the right place. We'll start off our week 7 recap with Thursday night football in a matchup between the Denver Broncos and the New Orleans Saints. In this game, we saw the Broncos take down the Saints to move to a record of 4-3 and three with a final score of 33-10. to 10. The Saints now fall to a 2-5 and five record after starting 2-0 and oh on the year. In this game, Bo Nix went 16 of 26 in passing attempts for 164 yards. We had Javante Williams rush 14 times for 88 yards and two touchdowns. And then in the receiving game, Troy Franklin leading the receivers of the Broncos. Five catches for 50 yards. As for the Saints, we had Spencer Rattler getting his second ever start, going 25 of 35 for 172. We had Kendry Miller leading the way for the backfield at the Saints, six carries for 36 yards. And then finally in the receiving game, we had Cedric Wilson Jr. with six catches for 57 yards and a touchdown. In terms of total offense in this game, we had the Broncos outgaining the Saints 389 to 271. Now, let's talk key takeaways from this matchup. Uh, as for the Denver Broncos side of things, uh, we have to commend their running game. They got 225 yards rushing in this game, averaging a whopping 6.5 yards per rush. That means within two rushes, you've already picked up your new first down. Uh, that's, that's pretty huge. You know, I am a little bit critical of this Denver Broncos backfield. I don't think that they have a real running back, but Javante Williams stepping up in a big way and a lot of rushing from Bo Nix himself in this one uh, helps propel the Broncos to another victory. The Saints, on the other hand, yes, you lost this game. Uh, losing by 23 points, you are going to have to do some reflection, but let's keep in mind all the injuries to their defense and their offense. Rashid Shahid, uh, Chris Olave, a lot of their Derek Carr, these guys all being down, that's going to play a huge part. And then along with that, you allowed your rookie quarterback to get sacked six times. Spencer Rattler hitting the deck six times in one game. Obviously, he needs a little bit of better protection. He's going to need more time to make these throws and these decisions. He's new to the league. And so, uh, the Saints not providing him with adequate time to complete his reads and make sharp throws probably also plays a part in their loss. After that, we will move into our London game of this week, which was a battle between the New England Patriots and the Jacksonville Jaguars. In this game, we saw the Jaguars get their second win on the year, winning with a final score of 32-16 to over the Patriots. Both teams entered this 1-5. Patriots fall to 1-6, while the Jaguars advanced to 2-5 on the year. In this game, we had Drake May leading for the Patriots in his uh, second start. And he goes 26 of 37 for 276 yards and two touchdowns. Not too bad for the rookie. He also leads them in rushing yards with three carries for 18 yards. And then finally, in the receiving game, Hunter Henry with a pretty big day. Eight catches for 92 yards. For the Jaguars, we've got Trevor Lawrence completing 15 of 20 passes for 193 yards and a touchdown. Tank Bigsby taking over for Travis Etienne with that shoulder and hamstring injury. And in the in the start, he goes 26 carries for 118 yards and two touchdowns. Very big day for him. And then in the receiving game, we've got Brian Thomas Jr. continuing his impressive rookie campaign with five catches for 89 yards and a score. In terms of total offense, New England was outgained by the Jacksonville Jaguars, 364 to 295. And now, my biggest takeaways for these two teams, uh, starting off with the Patriots, 38 yards rushing is not acceptable. That is definitely the reason why they lost their game, this game. And as I said, Drake May led the way with three rushes for 18 yards. That means the three 
New England Patriot running backs, Ramondre Stevenson, Antonio Gibson, and Jermichael Hasty combined for a total of 20 yards in this game. Yeah, if you don't establish the run, you're definitely not going to have much success. Something that they were able to do against Cincinnati and against Seattle, but not really all that much since. And Drake May has been doing his thing, you know, no turnovers in this game. Did a lot better than week one, but he's going to need some help from his rushing attack if they're going to try and beat any teams. And then as for the Jaguars, uh, you know, you just kind of have to applaud their ability to keep their composure in this game. The Patriots came out pretty hot. A touchdown on their first drive, a field goal on their second drive. They take an early 10-0 lead over the Jaguars. And when you're down 10 points early in a game and you're at a 1-5 record, it's easy to abandon the run, freak out, kind of start to spiral. Uh, and the Jaguars did not do that. They get on the field. They get a touchdown drive, they get another touchdown drive, and then they profit off of a New England uh, fumble, I think it was, something like that. And so, all of a sudden, you were up 22 to 10 when you were down 10 nothing. so 22 unanswered points in the third quarter. Uh, and yeah, that really marked the game for them. So good job to the Jaguars for being able to do that. Next up, we're going to talk about the Seattle Seahawks and the Atlanta Falcons. This was a matchup between two bird teams. We had the Seattle Seahawks walking away victorious with a final score of 34-14. to In this game, we saw Geno Smith complete 18 of 28 passes for 207 yards and finally two touchdowns. Kenneth Walker in the rushing game had 14 carries for 69 yards and a score. And then DK Metcalf leading the way for the Seahawks wideouts with four catches for 99 yards and a touchdown. As for the Falcons, Kirk Cousins completed 24 of 35 passes for 232 yards, one touchdown, but two interceptions. B. Sean Robinson with an impressive day with 21 carries for 103 yards and a score. And then in the receiving game, Kyle Pitts with one of his better performances, 7 catches for 65 yards. Now, when it comes to total offense, the Falcons actually slightly outgained the Seahawks, 369 to 339, but they still find themselves losing this game. And here are a couple reasons why. First, by the Seahawks, very clean game, played by them, very clean football, did not turn the ball over, and that is huge. Uh, no interceptions for Geno Smith is uh, very remarkable because he was leading tied for second place in the league in terms of interceptions thrown. And uh, a large part of that is he just has no time in the pocket. They're not doing a good job of protecting him, but not the case in this game. He was only sacked one time against the Falcons. So got to give it up to Geno for not throwing any bad passes for not turning the ball over and to the Seattle O-line for only letting him get sacked once. As for the Falcons, uh, the final score is not really indicative of how the game was for majority of it. You weren't really down that bad uh, until the fourth quarter and then that's when they completely, you know, screwed the pooch. They had three turnovers, including a fumble return for a touchdown, all in like the last couple drives in the second half. And so, uh, yeah, the Falcons at one point, I think they were about to score. They were in position, maybe down 10, yeah, about to score. And then uh, they get picked off, something like that. And so all of a sudden the game goes away from them, but yeah, uh, outside of the fourth quarter, the Falcons really weren't doing that bad. They they could have won at, well, they, not that they could have won, but they could have been in a much better position, and they just made a lot of late mistakes, so go on, kind of want to be a little better in the second half. After that, we move into our matchup between the Tennessee Titans and the Buffalo Bills. 1 and 5 Titans. Well, now they're 1 and 5. The 1 and 4 Titans were taking on the 4 and 2 Bills. Buffalo walks away winning 34 to 10 over the Titans. And in the 
this game, we saw Mason Rudolph get the start for this Titans team. He goes 25 of 40 for 215 yards, one touchdown, and one pick. Tony Pollard with 16 carries for 61 yards in this one. And Jacozium Okonkwo with four catches for 50 yards in the, for the Titans. As for the Bills, Josh Allen going 21 of 33 for two, 323 yards and two touchdowns. Still no interceptions on the season for Josh Allen. Then we have Ray Davis leading the backfield with five carries for 41 yards and a touchdown. And then finally, Keon Coleman with an impressive four catches for 125 yards. In terms of offensive yardage, uh, Buffalo outgained Tennessee by exactly 100 yards, 389 to the 289 of the Titans. And in terms of my key takeaways uh, for the Titans, I actually do have to commend them. I'm not gonna... Yes, you did lose by 24 points, but in the first half, the Titans were in control. They actually entered halftime with a lead, leading 10 to 7, and one, your defense was coming up, coming up huge, but also your offense doing just enough to keep yourself ahead. Uh, now, obviously, that did not persist as the offense stalled in the second half and the defense completely collapsed. They did not score any more points, and they allowed 27 second half points. So. You just have to find what you did in the first half and try and recreate that going forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, I personally did not think that they had a chance of winning this game, so the fact that they even led through half of it was very impressive to me. And as for the Bills, uh, looks like the Amari Cooper trade is paying its dividends early. You see the entire wide receiver room benefiting from this move. Uh, in this game, we had Keon Coleman, 125 yards, four catches. Amari Cooper in his debut, four catches for 66 yards and a touchdown. And even Khalil Shakur with seven catches for 65 yards. All these guys helping Josh Allen get a 323 passing yard day. Uh, you'll notice that it was all three wide receivers before Dalton Kincaid and Ray Davis on this box score. So. All the wide receivers stepped up, helped Buffalo get back on track, uh, get their offense back in the right footing. And after that, let us talk about a matchup between the Cincinnati Bengals and the Cleveland Browns. This is a game between two AFC North teams. In the end, the Bengals walk away with the win, 21-14 over the Browns. They moved to a record of 3-4 and four on the year, still looking to get back to 500, and the Browns unfortunately fall to 1-6. and six. Now, in terms of team stats, we've got Joe Burrow going 15 of 25 for 181 yards and two touchdowns for the Bengals. In the rushing game, Chase Brown with 15 carries for only 44 yards, and in the receiving game, D. Higgins leading the way with four catches for 82 yards and a touchdown. As for the Browns, Deshaun Watson completing a lot of passes, going 15 of 17 for 128 yards, but he would not finish this game. He exited with an Achilles injury, and it does look like he is done for the year. Now, in the rushing game, uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson, I believe is his name, DTR, he comes in for Deshaun Watson, uh, carries the ball three times for 44 yards, leading the Browns, before he also exits the game with a finger injury. And then finally, in the receiving game, we've got Cedric Tillman with eight catches for 81 yards. Offensively, uh, ironically enough, Cleveland leads the way in this one uh, with 336 yards to the 223 of the Bengals. It's not often that we see Cleveland doing better than another team on offense. Uh, but yeah, in terms of how this game went, my takeaways for the Bengals, uh, I still don't think that the pain, that this running game is serviceable. It was 59 yards on the ground for the Bengals, and they averaged 2.4 yards per carry across their backs and Joe Burrow, uh, and even the wide receiver sweeps that they were running. Overall, I think that they need to make some sort of move. I don't know what happened to Zach Moss. He just 
is getting phased out. Chase Brown not nearly as efficient as he was before, and the rushing game does need some sort of spark. I think either you bring someone in or you change something up, but it's not working, and you barely beat a Browns team. Like, I think there was a defensive touchdown by the Bengals in this one, or like a special teams touchdown, and in that case, your offense was only as good as the Cleveland Browns, and that is not okay. So, you win with win this week, but uh, it does need to be better going forward. And as for the Browns, um, I truly think it's time to, to call it. You're going to have to, unfortunately, enter that reset cycle once again. Look for your next franchise QB. This team, after a great, great season last year, battling through all those injuries, Kevin Stefanski winning Coach of the Year. You've got Joe Flacco, Comeback Player of the Year. Uh, the team is just down bad at 1-6, and six, you're, you're completely out of the playoff picture. Deshaun Watson owed all that money, has never finished a season, um, has never even really looked that good. It's, it's over. Uh, I think you call it, you tried, you failed, you had a little bit of a glimpse of hope with Baker Mayfield for a little bit, and you sold your soul for a guy who was not good at all, so you embrace the fumble, and you go back into that cycle. Maybe you go get a Shadur Sanders, uh, a Cam Ward, depending on who is available in the draft, who is declared for the draft. Uh, but yeah, truly tragic for the Browns to be back at the bottom. After that, let us move into a matchup between the Packers and the Texans. Uh, this was a very close, well-fought game, but in the end, the Packers would come out on top with a final score of 24 to 22 over the Texans, bringing both teams to a 5 and 2 record on the year. In this game, we saw C.J. Stroud of the Texans very limited, 10 of 21 passing for only 86 yards. In terms of rushing, we had Joe Mixon with 25 carries for 115 yards and two touchdowns. And then in the receiving game, Dalton Schultz leading the way with one catch for 28 yards. Not ideal. And then as for the Packers, we've got Jordan Love with 24 of 33 passes completed for 222 yards, three touchdowns, and two interceptions. Jordan Love throwing a lot of touching touchdown passes on the year, and uh, I think he would be leading the league if it were not for those two games missed with injury. Next up, in the rushing game, we've got Josh Jacobs with 12 carries for 76 yards, and though it's not in this stat line, Josh Jacobs finally ending his streak of the most carries without a, touchdown, without a receiving touchdown in league history. He catches his first ever um, catching touchdown, receiving touchdown as a running back, so uh, congratulations. And then after that, we've got Romeo Dobbs with eight catches for 94 yards in this Packers wide receiver group. In terms of total offense, both teams not producing that much. Uh, Houston with 197 yards and Green Bay with 277. Now, despite the three turnovers, Green Bay was still able to win this game, and that was largely due to the fact that C.J. Stroud was completely shut down in the second half. This offense was unable to do much at all, going into halftime with a 19-14 lead over the Packers. The entire opening 3-4 drives of the second half, uh, Texans could not do anything. Finally, with the game on the line, they do get their their act together, they go down the field, they kick a field goal, but then the Packers respond with their own field goal and win the game, so uh, got it going a little bit too late, and even then, it was mostly behind the legs of Joe Mixon, CJ Stroud, um, like, an unbelievable amount of struggle, I've never seen him struggle that badly before, and for the Packers, uh, it's time to give the Packers defense the, the credit that they're due, absolutely demolishing C.J. Stroud, making him a non-factor in this game, keeping the Texans under 200 yards of offense after their impressive performance last week against the Patriots. Now we take a look at this Packers team in the last three weeks. You've got the Texans, you've got the Cardinals, you've got the Rams. Uh, across those three games, they're allowing an average of 18 points per game, which is quite low. So, great job by the Packers defense. Obviously, the first
first two of those opponents, not that impressive, but keeping the Texans to just 22 and under 200 yards of offense, that is something that, if you can do this, if you can keep doing this, you're in a great place, because the loss against the Vikings, the loss against the Eagles, you did allow a lot of points, a lot of yards, and so for them to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an offensive juggernaut type of team and keep them limited like this, uh, great time for the Packers, good things to come for them, even though they say in third place in this division. Alright, after that we've got a matchup between the Miami Dolphins and the Indianapolis Colts. In this game, the Colts get, getting the victory against Miami with a final score of 16-10. to The Colts move to a 4-3 and record on the year, while Miami falls to 2-4. and In this game, we saw Tyler Only going 7 of 13 on passing attempts for 87 yards and a touchdown. We also had Tim Boyle play for a bit of the game for the Dolphins. Then in the rushing game, Devon Ajan, in his return from concussion, he goes 15 carries for 77 yards. And in the receiving game, we were led by the most dominant wideout on the Dolphins, John o. Smith, with 7 catches for 96 yards and a score. Now, for the Colts, it was another rather difficult offensive output. Uh, Anthony Richardson going 10 of 24 for 129 yards. Then we've got Anthony Richardson leading in the backfield. Jonathan Taylor out once again, unfortunately. Uh, so Richardson leads the way with 14 carries for only 56 yards. And then finally, we've got Michael Pittman Jr. who had three catches for 63 yards. Offensively, Miami actually led Indianapolis 337 to 284, uh, and that kind of shows you how bad Indianapolis was in this game offensively for the fact that Miami could outperform them with Tyler Only and Tim Boyle. Um, so our key takeaways in this matchup uh, got to be the Dolphins, honestly. Not much done wrong. Uh, it was, it really just comes down to your missed kick. You missed a kick, um, and you fumbled the ball all in the second half. If you had not missed that kick later in the game, you do have the opportunity to go for a game-tying field goal rather than having to go for a one-fourth down, and that's really all it was. Um, missing that kick put you in a worse spot later in your later possessions. And for the Colts, uh, it's been a lot of ugly victories, in my opinion. This team, Anthony Richardson's got to get better. I don't know what exactly I can say, um, but he's just not doing that well. Um, yeah, still under 50% of throws, and not throwing for very much at all. The offense doesn't look very nice. I... Jonathan Taylor coming back will help with that. Obviously, this is his first start in a while, but, like, I would like to say something positive about Anthony Richardson in one of these videos, uh, and we just haven't gotten to that point yet. Obviously, it's still not even at the halfway mark, but it has been a little bit of tough sledding when it comes to talking about his gameplay, because the offense is just a good amount better when he is not in the game. So, more reps, uh, more avoiding injury, and yeah, the healthier this offense is, hopefully the, the better it gets. Uh, it's, you're at a 4-3 and three record, but you're, you're playing like a, a two-win team, really. After that, let's talk about the Lions and the Vikings, probably the best game of the morning, um, was in the morning. Might have been in the afternoon. I think I got got a whiff of this in the afternoon, actually. Um, in this game, we've got the battle for the title in the NFC North, and the Lions come away with it, winning 31 to 29 over the Vikings. Both teams now sitting at a five and one record on the year, and the Lions they steal that first place spot from the Vikings uh, at the Vikings home field, by the way. In this game, we see Jared Goff complete 22 of 25 passes.
rushes for 280 yards and two touchdowns. In the rushing game, Jameer Gibbs with a massive day, 15 carries for 116 yards and two touchdowns. And then in the receiving game, Amon Ross St. Brown with an impressive eight catches for 112 yards and a score. Then for the Vikings, we've got Sam Darnold going 22 of 27 for 259 yards, one touchdown, one interception. Aaron Jones returning from injury uh, rather quickly, I might have had 14 carries for 93 yards and a touchdown, pretty good deal for him. And Justin Jefferson producing as always, seven catches for 81 yards and a touchdown. Now, when it comes to offensive production, it was almost dead even with 300. And 91 yards for the Lions to the 383 of the Vikings. Uh, and before we get into the key takeaways, I want to say that like this is one of the most even matchups that you will ever find. These two teams, they went band for band in this game, truly putting up like almost the exact same stats. Um, both had one turnover, almost the same amount of offense uh, when it came to rushing and res uh, passing. And even the score, they were off by a margin of two. So, talking about the Lions, um, nothing to even say. As for this game in particular, the offense has just been hot. They've been red hot for like the last four games straight, putting up lots of points, lots of touchdowns. I believe there's a stat out there uh, saying that like in the last 18 Lions drives, they've been scoring more touchdowns than they have Jared Goff incompletions, which is mind-boggling, and then, yeah, the only takeaway is Jameis Williams unfortunately getting suspended for two games with performance-enhancing drug usage, uh, that could be something, like, obviously injury is one thing, but for a suspension mid-game, mid-season like this, that could hurt the Lions' offensive production going forward a little bit, um, in Jama only getting suspended two games. Depends how you want to look at it. Obviously, it's bad. It might mess with their juju, their momentum, but it could be a lot worse. You could have gotten suspended for way more time. So, all in all, not too bad. You're going to miss him, but yeah, it definitely could be worse. And for the Vikings, I really have no notes. I, I'm not going to criticize them in any way. There's no real reason that they lost on this game. Yeah, it, it all just comes down to the two-point attempt that they could not get away with. Um, they went for two after one of the touchdowns that they scored. It was the touchdown after the David Montgomery fumble. It gave them the lead in the game. They opted to go for a two-point conversion and give them a three-point lead rather than a two-point. Uh, and I think that was smart. Situationally, it made a bunch of sense. And the play just didn't pan out. So if they had, then... This is a tie game, it goes into overtime, and you don't lose. So for the Vikings, you did a great job. I'm not going to say anything like you really had this game. It could have gone either way. It was immensely close, so don't beat yourselves up. You did nothing wrong. Uh, just keep playing how you've been playing, and you'll, you'll contend. Now, after that, we've got a matchup between the Philadelphia Eagles and the New York Giants, both the NFC East teams a little bit of rivalry. This is the Saquon Barkley revenge game. Uh, in this game, the Eagles would walk away with a victory 28-3 over the Giants. The Eagles climb to a 4-2 record, while the Giants fall to a record of 2-5 on the year. We've got Jalen Hurts completing 10 of 14 passes for 114 yards and a touchdown. Saquon Barkley going off on his old team. 17 carries for 176 yards and a touchdown. And then A.J. Brown with 5 catches for 89 yards and a touchdown. As for the Giants, we have Daniel Jones completing 14 of 21 passes for 99 yards. Then Tyrone Tracy Jr. 6 carries for 23 yards. That's all. And then in the receiving game, Malik Neighbors. Four catches for 41 yards. In terms of total offense, we've got 339 yards from the Eagles and only 119 yards from the Giants. Now, in terms of key takeaways, uh, I have to, you know, I'm going to give some props to the Eagles on this one for adapting uh, the Giants passing off 
defense has actually been surprisingly adequate on the year. They're not allowing a bunch of passing yards, but the Eagles, seeing what the game plan is, um, just adapting to what the defense is allowing, they rushed a lot. They ran the ball 45 times in this game and gained 269 yards out of it. So, uh, taking what the defense is giving, not trying to force the ball, only four incompletions from Jalen Hurts, no messy, unnecessary turnovers by him, and yeah, you end up winning big just by doing what is easiest, path of least resistance. And then for the Giants, uh, yeah, you lose by 25 points, obviously only putting up 119 yards of offense, you have to blame someone, and most people are going to point their finger at Daniel Jones, but the man was sacked seven times, and in total, there were eight sacks allowed in this game by the Giants. That offensive line is not cutting it for anyone, like when's the last time you heard someone get sacked that many number of times and still win a game? The only one that comes to mind is Joe Burrow against the Titans in the playoffs a couple years ago. But even then, like, it's not. That's not something you're trying to replicate. You don't ever want to be allowing eight sacks in a game as an offensive line. So, uh, you got to blend the line more than Jones in this one, in my opinion. And yeah, if, if he can get some better protection, maybe he can throw for one touchdown, maybe. I don't know. It's been a long time since Daniel Jones has thrown a touchdown pass at home for the Giants uh, fan base. So we'll see if that ever breaks. <laughs> anyway, after that, we have a matchup between the Las Vegas Raiders and the Los Angeles Rams. Two of the newest stadiums. Uh, I don't know. That's what came to mind. But yeah, we've got uh, in this game the Rams taking down the Raiders with a final score of 20-15. to 15. For the Raiders in this game, you had Gardner Minshew not getting the start, but taking over for the injured Aiden O'Connell, who I believe either fractured or dislocated his finger. He has been placed on IR. It will be Minshew Mania going forward. So Minshew in this game, putting up 15 of 34 passing uh, completions. 154 yards and three interceptions. Then, in the rushing game, 23 carries for 92 yards by Alexander Madison. And, receiving the ball, Brock Bowers with 10 catches for 93 yards. A very impressive front end stretch for Brock Bowers so far. He is actually on pace to beat Bukanukua's reception record that was just set last year. So, uh, despite the Raiders not having a great season, Brock Bowers, very promising, emerging young tight end talent. And moving into the Rams, we've got Matthew Stafford going 14 of 23 for 154 yards and an interception. In the rushing game, Kyron Williams going uh, 21 carries for only 76 yards, but two touchdowns. And then in the receiving game, Tyler Johnson leading the way with four catches for 57 yards. As far as team stats go, the Raiders actually outgained the Rams 317 to 259 in this one. But, uh, as my key takeaway points out, you just. These quarterbacks are not built to win games, man. The Raiders really being held back by their quarterback room, their quarterback play. And O'Connell starting this game, uh, having to leave, and now Gardner Minshew is back. I did see the last drive by the Raiders, and. It was not a pretty interception by Gardner Minshew. Face full of uh, pressure. He's down all the way back, practically in his own end zone. Just lobs the ball down the field into uh, the hands of Rams player. Not the best throw, not the best decision. I, I can't imagine what the Raiders must be feeling right now. But I do think that is the first step. Once you get a new quarterback, this team will be a lot better. Then, after that, for the Rams, I'm gonna say you got away with a win here. Uh, you didn't really play well offensively. Pretty pro poor performance from the Rams. They just happen to be the less mistake prone team. Four turnovers by the Raiders to the one of the Rams. Uh, gonna play a big part in their five point victory here. And that dude they scored, I think, on special teams and defense. Uh, and so, yeah, offensively not that good, but you do look to get Cooper Cup. 
come back next week, hopefully. I know he's been out for quite a while. And, uh, that should be helpful. But, shout out the Rams defense for forcing all these turnovers by the Raiders offense and uh, make them win the game. Alrighty, so after that, we've got a match between the Carolina Panthers and the Washington Commanders. Now, in a very unfortunate turn of events, Jaden Daniels goes down early in this game with an injury, and uh, it really does not affect the Commanders at all. They still win this game 40-7 to over the Panthers, but uh, he luckily avoided major injury. Only going to be out a couple weeks. He's week to week at the moment, and so that is good news for the Commanders. Now, taking a look at this game, we had Andy Dalton going 11 of 16 in the passing game for 93 yards, but two interceptions. Chubba Hubbard rushing the ball 17 times for 52 yards and a score. And then in the receiving game, uh, Jadavion Sanders with six catches for 61 yards for the Panthers. As for the Commanders, you've got Marcus Mariota going 18 of 23, filling in for Jaden Daniels for 205 yards and two touchdowns. Brian Robinson Jr. getting 12 carries for 71 yards and a touchdown. And then finally, Terry McLaurin with six catches for 98 yards in this one. In terms of total offense, it was a whopping 421 to 180 in favor of the Commanders. Uh, yeah, kind of a beat down here. Nothing to say uh, that could that could really defend the Panthers. Uh, most notable takeaway is it has to be that Andy Dalton kind of looked scared to throw the ball. He obviously had a couple of early mistakes throwing. Uh, I think a pick six very early on, and then another pick not too far after. And after that, he just had no confidence, and so the passing game was completely eliminating. The Panthers finish with 85 yards passing, and yeah, obviously not good. And even when they brought Bryce Young in towards the end of the game, he finishes with like negative two yards passing, I believe it was. Yeah, two of two passes for negative four yards. Yeah, so uh, Panthers passing attack. It's it's rough. So now you've got Andy Dalton playing just as bad as Bryce. Hopefully he doesn't make early mistakes like this because I think he just got really in his own head after that happened. Um, but yeah, and then as for the commanders, offense continues to roll. They have been doing really well. I think they have four games of over 30 points, or 35 points scored, and that's, that's a lot, but I have to see how the offense fares against teams with slightly better defenses. I know in their futures they're going to be playing against like a, a Steelers defense, I think a Giants defense, another defense that's a bit more stingy, and uh, with no Jaden Daniels, that could prove to be much tougher than this porous Panthers uh, defense, so in this game, they did amazing. <laughs> now, after that, we've got a match between the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers. A little bit of a Super Bowl redo, uh, rematch. And once again, the outcome was the exact same. Kansas City Chiefs winning at 28-18 to over the 49ers. Kansas City climbs to a record of 6-0 on the year. The only undefeated team in the league. While San Francisco falls to three and four in this game, Patrick Mahomes not doing particularly well. 16 of 27 passing for 154 yards and two interceptions. Then Kareem Hunt with 22 carries for 78 yards and two touchdowns. Then finally Noah Gray leading with four catches for 66 yards. 49ers on the other hand having also not a great day passing. Brock Purdy going 17 of 31 for 212 yards and three interceptions. Jordan Mason, 14 carries for only 58 yards. And then George Kittle with six catches for 92 yards. Uh, and man, I was watching the fourth quarter of this game, I think it was, and it was tough. It was a tough watch because the 49ers were in it for a little bit. They were not down that bad. Uh, I think down 14-12 at one point and really just things fell apart. 
drives of interceptions. The first one coming on a Brock Purdy pass to Ricky Pearsall. Uh, he just doesn't have that chemistry yet. Ricky, I don't know if he ran the wrong route or if Brock just sailed the ball way over his head, but went straight to Kansas City and stopped that drive, allowing Kansas City to score another touchdown. Then, down like 10 points, San Francisco, they have the opportunity to go score and make this like a manageable game. They get all the way down to the red zone and Brock Purdy, just like a bad, I, I don't know, I don't know if he got hit as he was throwing it, but even then, double covered, poor throw, intercepted in the end zone, they walk away with no points at all, and after that, the game's just over, um, they score once again later, but no one like it meant anything, and yeah, going into this game, I did say that like if San Francisco can play a clean football game, I think they have a chance, and they played far from clean, three interceptions, I'm not good, and they're, they're experiencing the most dirt, like, uh, injuries they can, uh, obviously, Ricky Pearsall finally making a start, but he was shot in the chest a couple months ago, you've got Depot Samuel not able to play in this game for, I think it was pneumonia, and then Brendan Ayuk tearing his ACL, he's out for the rest of the year, George Kittle, he did fine, uh, but even Juwan Jennings, I think, is, you know, uh, fostering a hip injury, so, all sorts of injuries on this San Francisco 49ers offense, not to mention Christian McCaffrey out for the last seven weeks. It's It's been bad, uh, but Brock Brady definitely making some very poor throws in this one. Uh, and then for the Chiefs, I can't even really compliment the offense. The offense has not been good. Um, it's Patrick Mahomes, I think, leading the league in interceptions at this point. It's really just been the defense uh, offense. A couple weeks ago, yeah, you could compliment them. This time, it wasn't a pretty showcase. Kareem on getting the job done. Patrick Mahomes, yes, he runs down the sideline that one time, and then he rushes in for the touchdown. But in terms of passing, it was bad. It was really bad. Um especially by his standards, and they're really getting it done by the defense. The defense, um, in the last four games, is allowing opponents under 15 points per game. So, really, it's the defense that's carrying them to this undefeated record. Weeks 1 and 2, Kansas City offensively doing a bit better, but since then, it's just been them profiting off of turnovers and doing well enough offensively, though they had they produce a lot of turnovers themselves as well, so I'm not going to give Patrick Mahomes any real credit in this one. Yeah, you had the one run, but it's it's more on San Francisco uh, that you can pin the blame, or the Chiefs defense. The Chiefs offensively, they are beatable. You just need to make less mistakes in them, and that hasn't happened yet. Uh, after that, we've got the Sunday night matchup between the Jets and the Steelers. Uh, this game would be taken on by the Pittsburgh Steelers at home. They win 37-15 to over the Jets in what was a close game at some points. Uh, Steelers climbing to a record of 5-2 and while the Jets fall to 2-5. And, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of rough. Uh, you've got... Russell Wilson making his first start for the Steelers. Uh, but let's talk about the Jets first. In terms of passing, Aaron Rodgers goes 24 of 39 on passes for 276 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. Then, rushing the ball, Brees Hall limited with 12 carries for 38 yards and a score, but he was unlocked in the passing game with six catches for 103 yards. Then, for the Steelers, Russell Wilson in his first game this year. Uh, he had 16 of 29 passes completed for 264 yards and two touchdowns. Najee Harris with 21 carries for 102 yards and a score. And then George Pickens with a big day, five catches for 111 yards and one touchdown. And he, two, he got two very, very nice 50-50 balls in this game. Um, as far as takeaways go, if you're the Jets, 
all I can really say is, uh, one, you need a new kicker. Greg the Leg is cooked. He is not. He hasn't made a single kick of over 50 yards. He's missed on more 40 yard attempts than he's made, and he's not even perfect. Uh, from 30 to 39 range, the guy has missed five kicks on the year. He is definitely costing you a lot of points, and I would get rid of him as soon as possible. You need a new kicker. And now, outside of that, gotta get on page with Devontae Adams. Devontae Adams coming to this Jets team was a big acquisition, a big talking point of the week. Uh, but, yikes, it wasn't that good. Three catches for 30 yards in his debut as a Jet. The least amount of um, yards between Rodgers and Adams in a long, long time. I forget if it was like 2021 or 2017. It was a, a long time. And, yeah, just going to have to be more familiar with the playbook, be a bit better. And then for the Steelers, I really have to tip my hat to Mike Tomlin because all I saw regarding this decision was criticism. I don't think I saw a single person applaud him and say, yeah, I think that this is the right call. He knows best. He's gonna, he's doing the right thing. And even I, I wasn't like the most on board with this. Russell Wilson, he had not played a game yet. Coming off this calf injury, Justin Fields has led you to a 4-2 record, doing just fine. Uh, but Mike Tomlin adamant that this is a quarterback competition. He wants to see what he can get out of both quarterbacks before deciding who should be the quarterback of this team for good. And uh, sticking with his gut against all odds. And yeah, obviously Russell Wilson with a great performance here. Didn't start off that off by but but by the end of it, rushing touchdown, two passing touchdowns, some great throws, and you really have to credit Mike Tomlin because he was the only one vouching for that. Um, and yeah, it just proves that these head coaches usually know what they're doing more than any fan or watcher or spectator. So, yeah. <laughs> Anywho, after that, we move into the first of our two Monday night games. First of these being a match between the Baltimore Ravens and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Ravens ultimately only winning by 10 points in this game, 41 to 31, but they were up by a lot. Uh, Tampa Bay actually ended up scoring 21 straight points in the fourth period uh, to make it a little bit more competitive, but it was not uh, not a good second and third quarter for them. Tampa Bay starts off leading 10 0, then by the end of the third, the Ravens lead 34 to 10, so big switch up there. In this game, Lamar Jackson with one of the most impressive stat lines you'll ever see. He goes 17 of 22 passing for 281 yards and 5 touchdowns. Then in the rushing game, Derrick Henry going 15 carries for 169 yards. And then in the receiving game, Rashad Bateman with 4 catches for 121 yards and a score. As for the Buccaneers, Baker Mayfield, 31 of 45 passing for 370 yards and three touchdowns, but also two interceptions to go along with it. In terms of uh, rushing, Rajad White coming back into the backfield picture. He has 10 carries for 40 yards, which is honestly a good day for him. And then Cade Otten leading the receivers with eight catches for 100 yards. And then when it comes to takeaways for the Ravens, it's really just amazement. I I truly cannot express how how impressive it is that Lamar Jackson year in and year out in the regular season can make football look so easy. This guy in his entire career, they have provided him with one 1,000-yard receiver, and that would be uh, Hollywood Brown. In 2021, he had 1,008 yards on the year, and no other season has he had a real bona fide 1,000-yard guy, and they don't really make it a priority because he is just so good with Mark Andrews and company. He is constantly able to put out performances like this. I just saw a stat saying that this is Lamar 
Lamar Jackson's fourth game in which he has five touchdown passes and five or fewer incompletions, and that is the most of any quarterback of all time in history. And for him to do that without, like, ever having a real wide receiver one, I am astounded. And it's just... It's so crazy how... how good he can be at times. I'm just stunned. <laughs> and for the Buccaneers, I feel a little bad just because this was a game that you entered. I honestly do think you had a, a solid shot of getting the upside here, but the rest of the season looks pretty bleak after the developments of this game. You've got Mike Evans leaving the game early with a injury, and then last two minutes of the game, um, the Buccaneers down, they down by 10, not really playing for much. Chris Godwin dislocates his ankle. He is done for the year. Uh, truly tragic because he was having the best year of his career, leading pretty much all the wide receivers in, in terms of fantasy, but having a top-notch year. And now the Buccaneers lose their two best wideouts, their two best offensive pieces. And yeah, what, what was a 4-3 and three start for the Buccaneers looks a lot less exciting the rest of the way through. So we'll have to see how they respond, how, who steps up. But yeah, just a killer set of injuries for them. Evans not going on a high R, but the fact that it was even a consideration shows you how bad his injury is. And then finally, we've got the matchup, the last matchup of the week, and this will be the Los Angeles Chargers versus the Arizona Cardinals. The Chargers would fall to the Cardinals in this game, uh, the Cardinals winning with a final score of 17-15. to Not a super exciting game, honestly. Uh, you have, in this game, Justin Herbert completing 27 of 39 passes, for 349 yards, J.K. Dobbins, 14 carries for 40 yards only, and then Will Disley stepping in for the injured Aiden Hurst, I believe it was, uh, with 8 catches for 81 yards. Then Kyler Murray for the Cardinals, 14 of 26 passing for 145 yards, 1 touchdown and 1 interception. Uh, not reflected here, but he also had a very long rushing touchdown, I believe, from like at least 40 yards out. And then James Conner, he had 19 carries for 101 yards, and he also led them in receiving with two catches for 51 yards. In terms of total offense, we've got 395 yards by LA to the 326 of Arizona. Now, this game really comes down to two things. Um, really just one thing. If you're the Chargers, it's the fumble the touchback rule. Jalen Rager catches a pass by the sideline, is making his way towards the end zone, fumbles the ball, it rolls through the back of the end zone, it is now a touchback for the Cardinals. Uh, that's it. That's the one play that if you can revert that play, you probably win this game. Because if you kick the field goal there, then you get three points, you beat the Cardinals. If you actually get the touchdown, you have enough points, you beat the Cardinals. The Cardinals, for them, it has to be the rushing defense. I did not expect them to be able to bottle up a rush-heavy team like the Chargers uh, at all. They've not been that good against the rush this year. The Chargers' entire philosophy is run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, and for the Cardinals to take that away from them, uh, so powerful and only allowed 59 yards rushing on the day. Uh, truly impressive by the rushing defense. They stand tall, uh, force the Chargers to pivot, and then causing that, causing multiple turnovers by the Chargers offense. It's, they get another victory here. Uh, yeah. And that does it for our week seven recap that is all of the games now we can move into a week eight waiver wire segment all righty and now we're finally ready for our week eight waiver wire segment of this video so if you are not familiar i'm gonna go 
through every skill position in fantasy football and make my top ads of this week by position. So first off, we're going to start with the quarterbacks. I've got three quarterbacks for you this week. The first one is going to be Tua Tungavailoa of the Miami Dolphins. He is right now owned in 26.5% of leagues, and he just got activated off the injured reserve. So Tua, obviously a very scary injury back in week two against the Bills. Many people calling for him to retire. He has said, no, I'm not retiring. I'm going to play, and I'm going to play without a guardian cap. So he's confident. Uh, he went off in week one against the Jaguars, and we know what this offense is capable of. You've got Tyreek Hill, you've got Jalen Waddell, uh, Devon A. Chan, Ray Moster. They have been unable to do anything without Dua, so Dua actually plays a very important role in this offense, and I would get him now before he makes this offense viable again, so buy low. Next up, after that, I'm going with the guy that I went with last week, and it's going to be Bo Nix of the Denver Broncos. He has owned in 16.1% of leagues, and last week he had another solid outing, but the thing that I liked the most about what he did was he had 10 carries for 75 rushing yards, and on the gear so far, he's the overall quarterback 13. That shows you that he's been pretty solid throughout the year, not even just these last couple weeks, but throughout the year, not too bad of a of quarterback option in fantasy. And he gets to go against a very easy Panthers matchup that just made Marcus Mariota look like Jaden Daniels. And then finally, at my third quarterback recommendation, going with Drake May once again. He's owned in 13.2% of leagues, and he just put up another week of 20 points. Uh, first week, he put up like 19 and a half. This week, he actually crossed the threshold and made over 20. So that's back-to-back -back weeks where he's averaging over 20 points. Not the best of matchups against the Jets this week, but we just did see Russell Wilson torch this Jets defense. And Drake May, he has shown that he can get it done both through the air and on the ground. So I think at some point, he is due for a rushing touchdown. And yeah, I would I would get him while he's still learning, because this team is not even at full strength yet. You know, you had Bob Douglas out for half the game, Jalen Bogue out for half the game. Uh, if all of their weapons are healthy, the, the longer he plays, the better he's going to get. I would venture out and maybe pick him up. Now, after that, we have our running backs. In the running back category, I've got three guys for you, and really these are deep ads, just because there were actually no running back injuries this week. Uh, a lot of injuries to wide receivers, but none really to running backs. So, here are my three guys for you. First up, we're going to start off with Ray Davis. He's currently owned in 14.6% of leagues. He had himself a very nice week last week when filling in for the injured James Cook, and I didn't know how involved he was going to be going forward, but uh, not a ton of touches this week. Still made the most of it, scoring a touchdown and overall having a productive week. So I think he has earned himself more snaps for sure. But along with that, uh, I do think that he is a premier handcuff consideration for this Bills offense. After that, I'm going to go with Patriots running back Jamichael Hasty. Uh, the Patriots running back room is a bit of a mess right now. Ramon Ray Stevenson getting benched a couple weeks ago. Then you've got Antonio Gibson who was supposed to go and take over, but he didn't do anything. And now Hasty enters the mix. His role has been growing in the past couple weeks, and he was the top receiver for the Patriots this week with five targets, five catches, and, well, not receiver. Uh, Andre Andrew was the best receiver, but he was the best pass-catching back of this group and even outdoing some of the wide receivers. So he's formed a trust, like a trustworthy relation with Drake May. Five catches, 49 yards, and a touchdown through the ground game. Yeah, he had like two carries for negative two yards, but that much value as a receiver is pretty good for PPR. And with this running back being room being as ambiguous as it is, you may as well go out and get him. He's only owned in 0.4% of leagues. And then finally, we've got a Jacksonville Jaguars running back for you, Dearness Johnson. He is owned in 13.5% of leagues, uh, and this is really only worth it if Travis Etienne is still out. But he had uh, seven, seven carries. What? Sorry, 
70 yards and four targets this week. And the four targets wasn't too bad amongst one uh, amongst running backs this week. And yeah, it's right now a two-man bunch with Tank Bigsby taking over on the early down roll, and then Dearness Johnson more so filling in as the third down back. But they were leading against the Patriots. More likely than not, they're going to be trailing against the Packers, and we could see Dearness Johnson get more work due to the game script. After that, we move into the wide receivers. Wide receivers, we saw a lot of injuries this week. Chris Godwin out for the year. Uh, we've got Brandon Ayuk out for the year. DK Metcalf week to week uh, with a MCL sprain. We've got Mike Evans week to week. A lot of major injuries this week to wide receivers. So we've got first up Cedric Tillman, <laughs> the Cleveland Browns. This is the guy who stepped up after Amari Cooper's departure. He saw 12 targets this week across three quarterbacks, albeit, but it was the most of any wide receiver in the league this week. And his longest pass of the day was a 25-yard catch from Jameis Winston, who I do think will be starting this week against the Ravens. And if you know anything about the Ravens, they are a pass funnel offense, uh, defense, uh, meaning that they limit the run and they force you to pass to beat them. That's what they've been doing. That's what they will continue to do. And the Browns weren't really able to run the ball, so I think that they're going to have Jameis in. They're going to throw it a lot, and we could see Cedric Doman increase or build on this impressive uh, day. After that, we're going to go with Jalen McMillan of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Right now, he's owned in 1.5% of leagues, and he figures to be the top wide receiver candidate to step up with the injuries to Mike Evans for the next four weeks-ish, and uh, Chris Godwin being out for the entire rest of the year. So, he saw eight targets this week, not bad volume at all, and yeah, the, the Buccaneers do like to throw the ball. Their top two guys are out. Jalen McMillan, probably the best option from that Tampa Bay wide receiver group out of Sterling Shepard and, uh, what is his name? Trey Palmer. And then, finally, we've got, uh, for the injured 49ers wide receiver group, Juwan Jennings, once again, he is on in 45.6% of the league, so quite a bit more than our other two, but, as I said, Ayuk is out for the rest of the year the year. Uh, Debo is also out currently with pneumonia, and I'm pretty sure it's still in doubt if he's playing next week or not. So as long as Juwan Jennings is able to come back from the same injury, he should be able to do a lot of damage. We saw him step up big already when the 49ers were injured earlier this week, and I do prefer him a little bit over Ricky, Ricky Pearsall, because Ricky Pearsall is still nursing that chest injury from when he was shot, and uh, he just doesn't have the same connection with Purdy, whereas Purdy trusts Juwan Jennings on third downs and has had some big games with him. So I'd go out and get Jennings from that wide receiver group. Now, after that, we can move into our tight end targets. We've got three in this category as well. Number one, once again, Cade Otten. I've been, I've been recommending Kate Otten for like the last four weeks in a row, and I'm sure you're getting tired of it. Probably a lot of you already own him, but he absolutely needs to be off, off the waivers this week. Owned in 42% of leagues, he was the number one guy for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this week, catching like 10 passes for 100 yards. Um, and yeah, he's now the number one option. He was the number three guy, but both one and two are gone. He is now Baker Mayfield's favorite guy on the field for this Tampa Bay offense. He finished as a tight end five this week. He saw ten targets. I don't know what else I can say to sell you on him. He he took a beating from those Ravens guys, but he is tough. He can make plays, and I think you absolutely should go out and get Cade on as your number one. Hunter Henry, owned in 27% of leagues. He had yet another good game with Drake May in at quarterback. Last week he got a touchdown. This week he had uh, just a bunch of yards. Nine, nine catches, nine targets, maybe eight. Um, eight catches for like 90 something yards. Very productive day for him. And yeah, well, the chemistry continues to grow. Drake May is an adequate passer. I think that Hunter Henry is a viable tight end going forward. And then finally, we've got a maybe one week more.
or stripping option. And Woe Disley tied in for the LA Chargers. He is. He saw 11 targets with Hayden Hurst out last week. Uh, put up his best game of the season so far. Was the leading guy for this Chargers wide receiver group. And uh, yeah, Herbert's been throwing more and more as the weeks have been passing. So with him getting back to his old ways, and if Hayden Hurst is out once again, then Will Disley might be his favorite target and could have another serviceable game. And finally, we've got our defense and special teams additions. I've got only two for you this week. Uh, first up is going to be the Kansas City Chiefs defense. They are playing, well, first of all, they've been playing very well, as I mentioned earlier in this video, only allowing under 15 points per game in their last four matchups. But they're also going to be playing the Raiders this week. Uh, and the Raiders are very turnover prone. Gardner Minshew just threw three interceptions last week. So we can ex expect uh, low scoring and a lot of positive points. And then finally, the other defense that I'm going with is the Chargers defense. They match up against the Saints this week. The Saints very injured on the offensive side of the ball, allowing a bunch of sacks. Spencer Rattler is still a rookie, not making that much positive development. And the Chargers defense has been allowing a ton of points, even against Arizona. It was only 17. And yeah, last week, Spencer Rattler in this offense gave it 22 points to the Denver Broncos defense, and that was the number one scoring defense. So you're going to want to target the Chiefs and Chargers defenses based on their matchups. And with that, we are officially done with this week's full Week 7 recap and Week 8 waiver wire. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. If you enjoy content like this, I'll be putting out more videos as the weeks progress. And yeah, thanks for watching, and I will see you.